and I'll come to you, Charlie, first of all. And it's basically asking what the benefits are of all these changes in, in, the, in mobility. So, because I guess when the internal combustion engine came along, everyone said, well, this is going to be fantastic and it will change the world, and it did, but, you know, we now have filthy cities and <laughs> there, are, there are unintended consequences as well. So what are the benefits and what are the... Is, is there a danger that there's a negative side that we're not seeing or thinking about? The benefits of connected autonomous vehicles. Yeah, I guess it's, it's hard to know which one, isn't yeah. it? Because it's all well, going to come at once, it feels like. But uh, let's say better mobility around, you know, autonomous, more people can do it. Uh, you know, just, just better mobility for everyone. Yeah, that, that, that's a really interesting question because if you look at uh, um, who's pushing autonomous vehicles, it's not the public. We're not all demanding autonomous vehicles. Well, a few of us are, but the majority are quite happy with the vehicles and transport we have available. Um, it's the automotives and it's industry and to some extent it's government because they see the value of developing a society where we develop, create, uh, and can sell to a global market. So in the UK, I do not see a business case for large-scale use of connected autonomous vehicles. Um, I think we have quite a good public transport system. It can always develop and improve, but I do not believe there is a business case for connected autonomous vehicles on that alone in the short to medium term. But do you think that it would be a it would be public transport effectively? They'd still be connected and autonomous, but they'd be it would be public transport rather than private vehicles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in certain use case scenarios, I see some benefits from them, but large scale adoption of autonomous vehicles. Sorry, you're speaking to someone who's very black hat here. <laughs> I, I, I just don't see the business case. Um, I see the business case to the economy of creating an economy where we can sell to others autonomous vehicles. But in the UK, uh, I see relatively little value. Nina, what is the business case? Because you could be one of the businesses that's driving it. Yes, we could be, or we, I think we are part of that today as well. So uh, I think, um, as well as the financial case, I think we have to think as well about the environmental agenda and it coming together and the changes that we're seeing in government policy to drive more of that environmental agenda. And we do see, and a lot of our, our Zipcar customers in London are quite passionate about that environmental side. So I think anything that's coming along in mobility that's going to make it, uh, make it more efficient, more effective, less damaging for the environment. I think it's going to be, that will be the case for us, as well as the financial case. How do you make that case, though, to the to governments and the, you know, and the people as well? It's, it's basically, Charlie's saying, you know, people don't really need it. There's no real need for it. How do you, how do you make the case that there are benefits? Well, we, we work a lot with the government and with the various different boroughs in London and elsewhere and with the, with the mayor's office. We have obviously got agendas, say, around environmental and around congestion. So. We, we make the case for car sharing and car rental as part of those, those groups and that lobbying. Um, and then we obviously, we do a lot of work with our, with our membership, our own membership, uh, to, to uh, take them through the benefits of car sharing. Alistair, what's your view on it? Are we, are we going down a road we don't need to go down? Uh, yeah, I'm probably, possibly not quite as black hat as uh, my friend Charlie here. Um, I, I, think, I think economics will dictate. I think if... Uh, if this sort of technological and regulatory sort of regime opens up to the, cent to the point where, you know, you can travel using these, um, you know, the mobility as a service, CAV model, whatever we call it, and you dial up the car and it's, it's so much cheaper, then I think, I think that will, you know, it's, it's like everything else, I think there, there will be large scale adoption. Um, I, think on the, I think on the electric vehicle side, I mean, it just sounds fantastic, doesn't it, in the sense that we, we have this car huge carbon problem, you know, it's, uh, unless you're in certain states of America, it doesn't apply, but for most of the, <laughs> most of the world, it does apply. And, um, you know, electric vehicles have, have come on the scene, and, and if you cast back 10 years ago, that those technologies were, you know, it wasn't really a serious proposition. Now it is, or it will be, we think, in five, 10 years. I think the challenge environmentally, actually, th those things haven't been identified uh, with electric vehicles. So, you know, what will we do as a, as, a, as a society, as a country, dealing with, I don't know, a million lithium-ion big car batteries each year. You know, there's, there's, there's sort of comments around, oh, we'll, second, we'll reuse them in our, in our garages, but how many do we need? And, and, and actually, producing these batteries, apparently, is, is super carbon intensive. So there's a huge sort of payback time. So I think, you know, in terms of EVs, it sounds fantastic, it's bright future. 
but there's a lot of questions that we haven't, we haven't got our uh, heads around you know, how to answer. Rachel, does it matter if the car companies and governments are pushing it and people aren't really asking for it? Because, you know, no one said, I want an iPhone, did they? And Apple went away and designed it. And I think that's a very fair point. But I think also I just pick up on, on some of the other points just made. I, I think I couldn't disagree more in a funny way because I think there absolutely is a business case for all of this stuff. I think congestion and, and road accidents right now cost us upwards of £30 billion a year each, every single year, and that's just the UK. And then by the time you build in the social benefits and some of the environmental benefits and all the other things that we've been hearing about, I think there is a staggering great business case. I think that the trick actually is to how you put it all together. And I think building that business case from the very beginning is the key. Because if we set out to sort of almost prove the case after the fact, we're going to be retrofitting what we've already got with what we're trying to do, which I think is, is possibly a very expensive and, and not a very smart way to go about it we have the luxury, perhaps, right now, of being able to look out and say, right, we can see some of these things coming. We don't know exactly how it's all going to go together, but we can see that certain combinations will work really, really well. And so you could start to eat into congestion. You could start to eat into road safety. You could start to think about you know, all those bits that would, in fact, make it far more popular and far more fair. I think there's also a health aspect here. We don't want to be getting rid of walking and cycling, but the, the health care bill for the country is enormous. And if through some of these technologies we can keep people mobile longer through using some of these vehicles and so on, that in itself has additional savings and all the rest of it can come into play and it, and it means people can stay as active members of society for longer. That's good, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, There's all we'll kinds of upsides, but it's think. about putting it together in the right way and doing the jigsaw in a way where we make a picture that makes sense instead of one that we're constantly on the back foot trying to you know, get back, back to square one again, I guess. Yeah. Phil, you're nodding vigorously on this one. You obviously uh, absolutely. <laughs> I suppose for two points, uh, if I look at it from a, a business point of view and then a, a, a taxpayer point of view. From a, from a business point of view, um, we, we have a problem with uh, finding logistics drivers, so freight, uh, so therefore autonomous vehicles um, helps us with the, the skills crisis that, that we have in that particular sector. Uh, from a health and safety point of view, uh, we have a lot of people out on the network um, who are at risk from members of the public. Um, having autonomous vehicles um, takes that out um, and, and, and keeps us uh, safe. Uh, but actually, from a taxpayer's point of view, getting vehicles to be um, closer together, uh, actually, do we need to widen the network? And actually, can we use the network um, better and be a lot cleverer? Um, and actually invest the money that we invest in roads at the moment. I'm doing myself out of a job by talking <laughs> about this. Um, but actually, can we invest that money uh, somewhere else? Let's go, I'll come back to you, Charlie. What's the alternative then? We, d we don't go down this road. What, what are we left with? Or do you think we could actually, we should be looking down at, at something else that actually is more about, you know, that is better for people than for businesses, for example? Um. Okay, so I'm quite black hat. And, um, I think there are use cases for connected autonomous vehicles, but as I said, widespread use, I, I don't see, um, uh, just referring to a couple of points there. In terms of what's the answer look like, I think we can do a lot more around how we use the network um, and manage the use of the network more effectively, how we encourage and manage demand more effectively. Uh, because if we're going to move into an environment where we're handing complete control over to a car, surely we should be able to hand control over to our network operators and government and get them to tell us when the best time to travel. So I think there's a couple of steps there. I also think in terms of how we maintain the network um, and how we build the network. We, from a, a, a user perspective, we seem to spend too long doing roadworks. There must be a better way to do it. Um, it's interesting, um, some of the questions coming up on the screen there, at two extremes or extremes you have stuff about autonomous vehicles and at the other end about potholes. Uh, how can we be talking about stuff at this end when we actually haven't sorted out a problem that's existed for as long as roads have existed? So I think we can do to do more to modular construction, modular maintenance. Uh, you talked about self-healing roads, things like that. That I think is actually more important in how we use the road network. Do you think that the customer voice is being lost in all of this because the big car companies are just deciding they're going to make money in a certain way and no one's really going out and finding out what people want? Um, yeah, to, to some extent, to some extent. I mean, you mentioned the iPhone there and none of us were sitting here saying we need iPhones and now we all say we need iPhone excesses and all that. Um, I think 
to some extent, the customer voice has been lost in all this, and we're all believing what the automotives are saying. But I do think people want to see progress, and they want to see uh, opportunities for other people to use technology to allow them to move more effectively and efficiently. But I, don't, I think the customer doesn't speak with one voice. They speak with many voices, and that, those change over time. And that's the problem for us as the industry, is how do we respond to that? Yes, Alistair, how do we respond to that? How do we know what we're going to need in 50 years' time? So it was Henry Ford, wasn't it, who said something about if, if I asked people what they wanted, it would, you know, it would be a faster horse rather than a, <laughs> rather than a car. Um, it's, it's a difficult question. I mean, I, I, th I, think, there's a, I think there's a wider question around um, pub uh, social, social uh, values almost in, in the sense that, you know, we are, we're living in a, in a fairly unsustainable way as a, as a society. At some point, that's got, a, that's got a kilter back to a sort of more sustainable way of living. Um, at the moment, all the economic indicators are actually pointing in the other direction. So in terms of materialism and consumerism, we're, we're increasing more and more and more. Um, in, terms of, in terms of transport, um, my, my guess would be that uh, you know, the, the icon of owning a car will, will fade away in the next 10, 20 years. It's a guess. And it's, it's definitely not a, um, a uni it won't be a universal uh, trend. Some people will still want to maintain their cars potentially in the, more in the rural societies. Um, so so there's, a, there's, a, there's a confluence of things there. How do you, how do you guess what people want? If I, if I could answer that, I'd be, uh, I'd be in a different job, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I think if, we, if you want to know, you ask people who are younger than any of us on the panel today. So, you know, when we've done studies, if you look in London at car sharing, for example, we've just done a study that just less than 50% of 18 to 34 year olds have tried car sharing. If you go into a higher age group that I would happen to fit in, that drops to one in four. So I think if you talk to younger age groups, they're much more comfortable with using mobile apps, much more comfortable with the concept of mobility than necessarily, certainly, you know, I would be, you know, with it if I wasn't in the industry that I'm in. So I think that's what we have to do more is, is talking to the younger generation of millennials that are coming through, where they have, uh, you know, the, the environmental consciousness, social conscious comes through as well. I think that helps us decide and, and think about what we want in the future. Right, there's, there's a question come up on here, but I can't see it. It's about the haves and the have-nots. Can we get that one back up, actually? And I'll, I'll, I'll come to something else briefly, first of all. I mean, Rachel, who do you think, and actually someone had mentioned this as well, who should be ultimately kind of driving this? <laughs> Good pun. Yeah, yeah, sorry <laughs> so about that. No, I think, I mean, Don't blame me. No, <laughs> it's OK. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, in terms of who's really sort of in, in a position to influence, a lot of it does come down to that, the, the, sort of the, the, the public opinion and so on, because that is actually where the political voice and that sort of thing starts to, start to come from in terms of what people are prepared to stand behind and so on. Um, there's some interesting research done quite recently, it, it needs a lot more sort of, um, you know, sort of digging and so on to really establish the, the detail here, but early research on some of the things to do with whether or not we'd be prepared, for example, to go towards more of a pay-as-you-go model for road use, actually it's surprisingly positive in terms of the public saying, you know what, we might just be okay with this. So I think there was a recent survey, this is with my ICE hat on briefly, but just under half of the uh, public opinion survey that was commissioned um, a couple of months ago showed just under half of people would be broadly supportive. Um, around a quarter of the remainder, uh, sorry, a quarter of, of that other total, so about three quarters altogether, would either be neutral or supportive. So actually, it's a funny thing. We might not be as far away as we think from some of the, the, sort of the general public support being there in order to start to bring through some of these changes. But I think the other point that just springs to mind is I, we are spending an awful lot of time, not just over these couple of days of this conference, but as an industry right now, thinking about all of these problems and whether it's from the point of view of infrastructure owners and operators or whether it's from the point of view of those with some of the ideas in terms of what we might change and future schemes and so on, or indeed the fleet operators, whether it's heavy vehicles, light and so on. I, I'm not sure anybody's thinking about it very much more than all of us are, actually. And I think it's time that we all sort of found our voice a bit and actually got some of these messages out there in terms of what that potential could be. 
Because I think if we start to sort of put some of the options on the table, it might well be that we find people say, well, actually, that sounds, that sounds all right, as opposed to something where at the moment it's very difficult to predict what it's going to be because people can only choose from the things they can sort of see. I mean, you can't, you can't ask somebody to make up a solution that doesn't quite exist yet if they're not you know, living in a world where, they, where those sort of different elements are almost laid out in front of them to start to think about. So uh, it sort of strikes me that maybe we're sort of overthinking it. Maybe we've done some of the thinking. We just need to always just get on and start presenting some of these options and just see where that leads. Because as I say, these baby steps will probably be the things that take us forward. And if, if we're all kind of agreed on where we're trying to get to, which is you know, something that's sustainable and affordable, etc., we won't be going the wrong way, will we? Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Do you think everyone's just thinking, where do I start? Because yeah. if I put I, exactly my money that. down that I route... I think that's exactly what it is. And yeah. everyone's watching everybody else. And, yeah. and for all this talk about leadership, actually, I think we've got a lot of, you know, well, well, we'll do what they do, but when they do it. And maybe it's a case of sort of taking some of those steps, but they don't have to be hugely dramatic necessarily, but just getting things on the road. And we have, we've got a load of great examples of that going on all around the country. But, but starting to join those together and then you know, edging it forward again and again and again, I guess. Yeah. One of the questions was mm. Elon Musk, more or less, <laughs> question mark. More. Yes. <laughs> and I, gu I guess that sense is, is someone like that just comes along and it doesn't matter what governments are doing because they just change everything, don't they? But, but kind of just to pull on Elon Musk, um, uh, as, a, as a nation, we're quite reserved. Um, and actually, innovation here is, I think, really important. Um, and actually, are we, are we being innovative? Um, uh, and have we got, in, you know, we, we've, we've come up with a load of this is what we want to do, but actually we haven't got the solutions. And actually Elon Musk coming up with a Hyperloop, um, flying cars, um, actually having that kind of imagination and the money, um, I think is probably, you know, now time to, you know, so let, let's try and, inc let's get the messages out there, as you say, and let's get people being more innovative um, and allow them to fail and fail fast so that we can learn quickly and move on. So I think this is going to be a very fast paced. There, there were questions here about Hyperloop and about flying cars as well. I mean, do any of you think you know, either of those sort of projects are going to be, you know, you know, bear fruit? Are we going to be traveling across America in Hyperloops? Are we going to be flying around in autonomous taxis? Because they are testing them, aren't they? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> black hat versus yeah. Right, OK, so I actually think that flying cars are, is an easier problem to solve than autonomous vehicles on the road. Uh, the airspace is already regulated. We've already handed over control of the, the direction and the speed that uh, our planes travel at and drones travel at. Um, people are quite happy to hand over um, control of planes to uh, machines. Many planes fly uh, under cruise control and land already. Um, I think the benefits of air travel are much better. You still, you don't face the problems of repairing and maintaining roads. You don't face the problems of integration with uh, non-autonomous vehicles. So actually, um, flying taxis or flying autonomous vehicles, I actually think is probably an easier societal problem to address than autonomous cars. The technology may be more complex, but remember, Autonomous vehicles is much more than a technology problem. It's a social, economic, uh, behavioral, regulatory, and a technology problem. So um, unusually, quite positively, I think that <laughs> flying cars uh, are, are a potential. I also think that uh, Hyperloop as well has a place. Uh, and there's been some great development work um, by version Hyperloop 1 on, on their test. Um, whether it will completely transform what we do in the UK is debatable. Um, there, there are big forces at play here. Uh, if you put Hyperloop in, uh, in the UK, you could reduce travel time from Cumbria to London to less than half an hour. Uh, the consequence is we'd all live in Cumbria rather than London, which would mean that land prices in London would drop dramatically. A lot of pension funds, investments, uh, etc., would fall and there would be financial ruin. So we need to be wary of unintended consequences. Let's talk about public acceptance a bit here. Do you think whatever people come up with, the public will get used to? Do you think they'd get in a tube happily, you know, going through a vacuum? And do you think they'd get in a flying cab quite easily? And do you think that in the end, the public will accept anything? Like we get an aeroplane now, and that aeroplane basically takes off and lands for you, and the pilot watches. Alistair, do you, do you think the public ultimately will, will accept anything? Um, well, there's some 
you know, if you, if you look back through history, there's a few sort of uh, transport disasters, shall we say, you know, if you think back to the, uh, you know, the, the air balloons and all that, uh, going back in my time, so no, I don't. Um, I struggle a little bit with the flying car <laughs> concept, um, not, not simply because of the, the prospect of the sort of safety case, I suppose, associated with it, um, but also the actual physics of it. You actually need so much energy to, 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 to fly these vehicles if, you, if you're doing it on a kind of one-man, two-man sort of, you know, Flintstone sort of uh, world. Um, so Hyperloop, I think, will have a future at some point um, because, you know, the, the benefits that it, that it could potentially realize are, are absolutely unbelievable. You know, the, 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 the concept of uh, moving labor markets within, if you can maintain, uh, if, you, if you can achieve that within, a, within 40 minutes, if you can get destination from where you live to your labor market, uh, your labor market, your, your place of work to within 40 minutes, then you see some quite revolutionary changes in the way people work, the land prices, the whole, the whole system. So I think, I think Hyperloop, and I think the public could, could be brought along with Hyperloop. Um, flying cars, I'll, uh, I remain to be convinced, but uh, I'll let Charlie get in first and then we'll, uh, then we'll see. Yeah. I think um, it's interesting, isn't it? I think, um, I'm not sure this is an either or kind of a choice. I think it's all just and, really, because I can see there's a, there's a use case for all of these different things in different ways, and I think over time that shifts. So your question about, you know, what public acceptance will be, we probably won't accept on sort of, you know, day one that we're all going to hop on board Hyperloop and off we go. I actually think we might want to just check it out for, you know, smaller, uh, smaller sort of use cases first, because some, I don't know, some less um, life-threatening and life-critical ones before we're prepared to put ourselves, you know, literally in that, well, non-driving seat, I suppose. But, um, you know, you can sort of certainly see a use case for freight. That's one of the qu comments and questions that's come up there. I think in terms of the drones, there are all sorts of quite interesting, relatively short-term use cases there. Uh, emergency services, um, I was talking yesterday one of the other stages to do with things around uh, blood services. You know, at the moment when you really need something, you can absolutely see that things like that could well be something that could come through quite quickly and, you know, small light goods, that kind of thing. So I think it's all about and, and it's just about a changing mix of our transport system and different ways of getting things around. We're still going to want to move, we're still going to want stuff. And unless we're going to 3D print all that stuff inside our living room, that stuff's got to get there somehow, hasn't it? So, so I think, you know, from a demand point of view, it's there. It's just, it's more of a mix. Uh, you mentioned something a few questions ago to do with, you know, the, the way in which that system goes together. And I think in terms of the road space, the best possible solution is one where in the long run we move towards ownership models, which are where the vehicles, all the vehicles within the network in whatever way become much more of a public asset as opposed to having a private set of assets running around on you know, a public network essentially. And I think there's no doubt that that would lead to all sorts of interesting efficiencies and so on that would be absolutely you know, beneficial in that long run. So yeah, at the moment, the cars are almost the odd ones out, aren't they, in terms of the way it actually works. So I, I think there's, there's a whole wealth of different things in front of us here, and it's about catching the useful ones and putting them all together, like I was saying before. That's exactly yeah. where you come in, Nina, mm. I suppose, isn't it? It's <laughs> that sort of, uh, you know, people getting used to the idea of not owning their own car and sharing a vehicle. Mm. Someone mentioned, you know, driving licenses, and particularly young men are not going to drive. I've been drilling my son for years about cars. He's not remotely <laughs> interested you know are, are we just moving I mean I know what you're going to say Nina because obviously it's your business will do well mm. out of it but uh, you know what what sort of po what sort of practical steps are you taking to get to that point it's, it's, I guess it's like a zip car but for um, for autonomous vehicles isn't it at the moment rather than someone hiring a car for seven days I'm assuming your long-term model is someone presses a button on an app and it appears at their door Exactly, yeah. I think it's, it's building on the blocks of, you know, you see today, you know, digitization of businesses, much more use of apps, it becoming much more on demand. So I think, you know, we already see today in the sharing world that if, you, if you're not very close to the vehicle, if it's not parked, I think we see within, you know, less than an, an, an eight minute walk, you're not going to walk any further to get to something. So I think the future is much more that the car comes to you uh, and then it's delivered on demand to you, so it's, there's very close proximity. 
Um, but you're already starting to see some of that through what's happening with sharing. And I think it'll be, it, it will be this gradual. Sometimes I think we, we talk about it's probably almost kind of black and white, that there's where we are today, and then there's this end journey that's completely autonomous and connected, and it's going to be quite a long journey in between as we go through those stages. So, but certainly, you know, as I said before, we see uh, a very different attitude towards car ownership from um, younger generations, whether it's getting your driving license or just not wanting to make that big in capital investment in a car and then see it sitting around on your driver and the, the street for 95% of the time. You know, and I think that's quite sorry. a generational shift. What, what's the age profile of people using a zip car, getting a car for a few hours? Does it tend to be younger people? Yeah, yeah I say that we've got, it, it's more between the 18 and 34 year category. I mean, not entirely. We do see um, people, you know, in the older age categories also using car sharing, but it is definitely uh, be more attractive for younger people. Uh, Alistair, I want to talk to you about the energy, how we're going to power all of this. Uh, we talked about it briefly when we had a session on sort of electric vehicles. Mm. From what I can gather, we're not really there at the moment in terms of preparing the country for a big surge in electric power so that's going to be needed. What's so your take on it? So there's a, there's a th few aspects to that. Um, in, in crude terms, if you converted all the miles that people travel in all the, all the vehicles and you said, OK, it goes from fossil fuel through to, to electric vehicle, it adds round about 30 to 40 percent on our average electricity usage. So it's not actually it's not a sort of factor of 10 thing, 30 to 40 percent. And actually, in terms of, in terms of capacity, uh, that's not a huge issue because we have got, we may, we may need to beef it up in parts, but we have got quite a, quite a bit of resilience in, in the power system, both in terms of the uh, actual power generation, and, but, but, but also uh, in terms of a sort of national distribution. Where, where, where it does get tricky is the last leg. So from the, when it comes from the national grid through to the local distribution networks, uh, the DNOs as they're called in the energy industry, if you have, there are scenarios, there are use cases that say if you have a uh, past a saturation point of electric vehicles and people are rapid charging, then there will be instances of um, where the actual underlying substation network needs to, be, needs to be beefed up. Otherwise, there's just not the resilience, there's not the capacity in those substations in, in certain places. If you, if you then introduce demand management and sort of slower rates of charge, you know, overnight charging, it becomes less of an issue. What's, what's not been, you know, you know th this, this whole situation is complex in the sense that there's, a, there's an energy system that for the first time has to start talking to a transport system. And there's a, there's a myriad of solutions that are, that are out there from the, from the battery in somebody's garage to the mega battery on the M6 through to a whole host of private investors trying to uh, you know, get some return on EV charge points and, all, and, and everything in between. Um, but in pure energy terms, you know, the major thing on in terms of electric energy isn't isn't electric vehicles. It's if we trans uh, if we turned off our gas energy uh, and and uh, switch to electric. So that would have a much bigger impact in energy terms than the electric vehicles. Phil, you you painted a picture of very big changes very quickly. Possibly not even needing roads. Possibly not needing garages on the sides of the roads. How how well placed are we as a country? to adapt to change. We seem to have these good ideas, but our reputation, I could be wrong on this, is that we're great at having the ideas, but we're not really good at then monetizing those ideas, and other people take them and run with them, and then the Chinese and the Americans make them brilliant. So how well placed do you think we are as a country to take advantage, if there are economic benefits of this or mass transportation, of those benefits? Um, I think we do a lot of talking uh, about it, um, and I think uh, we're very good at adapting in um, when something critical uh, occurs, um, but actually uh, when we are required to plan ahead, um, I think that's where as a, as a nation we, we, we fall down. So I think we, we're, we're not particularly good at uh, planning uh, particular scenarios, uh, playing them through, um, understanding the risks, um, and then actually moving forward. Uh, and I think it really comes back to the um, innovation piece that I said earlier, that 
We, we really need uh, innovators. I saw something there about disruptors. You know, who are the disruptors going to be? Um, uh, and you know, who, who are those clear thinkers rather than the analytical civil engineers that we potentially have today? How do you encourage disruptors? <laughs> or is, that, is it impossible? They just come out of nowhere, don't they? No, I, South I, I, Africa. So for me, there's a, there's a leadership <laughs> issue here, isn't there? About as, as leaders, uh, we need to recognise that uh, we require uh, different skill sets um, for the future, uh, and therefore going out into the labour market um, for those the, the skills that we've been uh, hunting for for the last 40 or 50 years isn't going to help, and therefore uh, not only do you go into a, 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 a wider pool of, of intellect, but you need to be significantly more diverse. Charlie, what's your take on how, how well prepared we are and how good we are at adapting our skills? I hear a lot about skills gaps. The government talks about it all the time. But are the schools adapting to train up the people in the right way? And are we producing the right sort of, you know, the right skills that we're going to need? I think I've turned up to the wrong conference. This is an education <laughs> conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so my, my view, uh, not particularly informed about uh, schools and education, I think as a society or a UK society, we treat the word failure uh, or fail as a bad thing. Um, when we adapt, when we develop, when we evolve, we've got to learn to fail and learn from it and move on. Too often when things fail, we point the finger of blame. And when things fail, we don't fail and learn quick enough. Uh, we, we fail repeatedly or we fail slowly. So I think it's about the learning process. We have to make a safe environment for people to try things out. If they don't work, let's move on and develop. And I think in quite a few places in society, we uh, try and protect people, protect society from failing. But actually, that's part of learning and evolution. OK, we'll finish up by sort of one little gaze into the future along the line. So where do you, say, see transport in, in 20 years' time, let's say, realistically, Rachel? What do, what do you think is going to be the sort of the biggest sort of difference that we'll see? Sure. So, um, gosh, it's tricky, isn't it? 20 years. So I think we will have gone a very long way along the path towards electric. We'll probably be pretty much there. It may even be post-electric. We could be into hydrogen fuels, all sorts of other things beyond that. Um, I think we will probably have moved an awful lot faster than we can possibly predict now in terms of the things we've been talking about um, in the session here and I know prior ones as well. So I suspect we will be, uh, yeah, towards a full connectivity scenario. I suspect we'll have a whole new fleets to deal with. I should think the infrastructure will have already evolved and adapted and, and hopefully we'll be in a better shape in terms of having that mindset going forward because we're going to have to do it again and again and again. Phil? Yeah, I, I agree that we will be uh, much more connected um, uh, and also the, the, the infrastructure will have significantly changed. Um, I think gantries uh, are a thing of the past. Um, signing will, will come straight into the, uh, the black box um, in, in your vehicle. Nina? It will be much more on demand, much more autonomous, and uh, I'd like to hope a safer and uh, more environmentally friendly world in 20 years' time as well. I think we'll be uh, mostly electric on the, on the car side. I think the car technologies will be, will be streaming ahead, and I think, if you like, government or transport authority usage and control of those technologies will be lagging quite quite a way behind, and it will be it will be finding it it will be finding it hard to to keep up with the pace of change, and I'll uh, I'll be retired hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, um, I see there being much greater diversity of vehicles on the road, from fully autonomous pods through to vehicles that are sold this year still being on the road. I see it being a more challenging environment in the road environment. Um, I see there being more information being provided, more guidance, but actually greater diversity in the types of the way people use that information. Fantastic. Well, thank you. It was a really lovely, lively debate. Thank you all for, for taking part, and thank you all for coming to the final session of Highways UK this year. Uh, I want to quickly thank Paul and Andrew just for organising this incredible event. They're a small team, and actually what they've produced over four years is stunning, really. So thank you to the panel, and thank you to the conference, and good night. <laughs> <laughs>